WGAC. This is the Austin Rhodes Show. I'm Jared Gay, uh, definitely not Austin Rhodes, and I'm filling in for him because he's on vacation. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800, toll free from Aiken by dialing 441-TALK, T-A-L-K, that's 441-8255, and for Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. All right, guys, so if you are not used to hearing my voice, my name is Jared Gay. I was uh, lucky enough to get invited to come guest host for Austin Rhodes while he is out of town. Uh, first of all, I definitely want to thank Austin for giving me that opportunity. We uh, today have a few guests who are going to be coming on and talking about some local issues. Uh, be introducing the first one here in just a moment. We'll also have some local activists coming down to talk about some of the stuff going on in Richmond County. Uh, if you are a regular listener, then you know that I've come on several times to talk to Austin about the uh, local Richmond County Democratic Party and kind of what's been going on with the elections uh, with regards to that. So. We will uh, have a couple of folks on to talk about that in the second and third hour. We also have a guest coming on uh, during the um, at the end of the second hour, and I'm not going to give it away by uh, saying his name, but he'll be calling in to make a very interesting and important announcement, so definitely make sure that you are tuning in for that. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, again, my name is Jared Gay. I have lived in Augusta for pretty much my whole life. I've come on the show several times. That was me just sort of a minute ago on the uh, intro theme that I recorded for Austin. Can't take credit for writing the song, but can take credit for uh, the one that you just heard at least. And so I am definitely not what most of you are probably used to hearing in terms of political affiliation, political alignment. Um, I definitely am a self-identified progressive, uh, a leftist. Hopefully I didn't lose half of the audience already uh, by saying that. But I've loved calling into the show many times over the years to talk to Austin about uh, with whatever issue happens to be going on in the news at the time and to also come on from time to time and play some music. Uh, for those of you who know me, uh, you might know me from the Augusta University or rather Georgia Regents University protest that uh, Austin put on a few years back. I wrote a protest song about the renaming of the university and then we wound up uh, coming in here and performing it for us. Uh, so. We're going to go ahead and jump into it. I'm going to get my first guest to uh, introduce himself to you. We uh, are going to start off talking about a local race that's going to be coming up and a very, in my opinion, a qualified individual who's coming on to talk about his own candidacy. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and let him introduce himself. Uh, this is Dr. Drew Kemp. Hello, my name is Drew Kemp. Um, I am running for the school board in Columbia County, uh, District 3. Um, I am a professor at Augusta University. I teach in the College of Education, and I teach curriculum, instruction, research, and social justice classes. All right, excellent. And uh, just to, full, uh, in the interest of full disclosure, I have known Dr. Kemp for a number of years, and um, he is definitely one of my favorite professors from Augusta University whenever I was... Uh, whenever I was attending there, and he is a professor of education. Uh, he definitely knows more about education than probably anybody else that I know, so I, uh, I'm going to give him the opportunity to talk about that. So you're running for Columbia County Board of Education. Yes, I am. Okay, and what, well, first of all, tell us a little bit about yourself, your own background. What was... Uh, Absolutely. Um, I have been in education my whole life. Since I was in pre-K, uh, when I was about five years old in Melbourne, Florida. I have been in education for my entire life with the exception of one year. I've either been a teacher or a student. So now at 48 years old, uh, 42 years of my life have been dedicated to education in some way. You definitely just identified your age uh, for anybody who can quickly add up the years. Uh, but he, so tell me about the kind of classes that you currently teach at Augusta Absolutely. University. Absolutely. I teach classes in curriculum theory, which is the, the theories behind why we teach what we teach. Okay. Um, I also teach uh, classes in pedagogy, which is uh, instruction. Um, I teach current practicing teachers, hopefully, to be better current practicing teachers. And I, I will, in full disclosure, also say that Jared was one of my students. Um, what, in 2010 or 11? Around then. I graduated in, uh, at the end of 2013, so... Okay, been, yeah, yeah 2010 or 11, well. somewhere in there. Um, and he's gone on to a successful year, and I will take full credit for that. <laughs> 
you may wind up wanting to uh, back away from that at a certain point um, in, in case I ever wind up saying the wrong thing and getting myself in trouble. But, yeah, but if you <laughs> do that, I'll just say time has passed and you forgot everything. Fair enough. And we can chalk it all up to um, improvisation and speaking extemporaneously. Uh, I, absolutely, which is something we can talk about also. Um, I also teach classes in research and statistics. Um, I direct a number of theses for a number of graduate students, and I also teach in our doctoral program um, on studying place-based education, um, using the community as your curriculum, and social justice. Excellent, excellent. And what do you think it was originally that drew you to the career of teaching? Um, I, I do remember. I was... I believe I was in the eighth grade. It was a math class, and my teacher's name was Mrs. Beaupre, and I was talking to her, and I asked her if she liked her job, and she said she loved it, and I asked why, and she said a couple of reasons. One, um, I love the subject, and number two, it makes me feel young, and I was like, well, that's kind of an interesting thing. I'm, you know, being a kid, I'm thinking the money or something like that or the hours or the summer's Definitely off. Definitely not the money. It's not the money. <laughs> it's not the summer's off. None of those things are true. Um, but that is, that's kind of why I was drawn to it. You know, that ability to continually feel young and engaged because unlike some jobs, it's not repetitive. You that know, is definitely it, true. It's not the same thing day in and day out. Um, you know, if you work in retail, fashions change, but the job's kind of the same, but mm -hmm. people always change. So you always get new students, new ideas. And it keeps you fresh all the time. New policies, new standards, new administration. <laughs> yes, policies. New acronyms. Uh-huh. And all those things are true. But it, it does keep you on your toes all the time. And it allows for a certain spontaneity in your existence. Because you have to make quick decisions all the time. And you're always trying to do things for the betterment of other people. I think that's an excellent way to talk about it. I think most people who go into careers in public service, whether it be teaching, uh, you know, firefighters, police, anybody, uh, medical as well, I think uh, a lot of people, that's something that you hear oftentimes when you ask them what made you decide to get into that line of work. Uh, usually it's something along the lines of, I didn't want to feel like I was wasting my time. Not that people who don't work for the public sector are wasting their time in any sense of the word, but I think that... Um, it's great to hear that response from teachers, especially for the last couple of decades. There's been so much controversy surrounding things like um, the na you know, nationalized curriculum mm -hmm. and Common Core. And um, even at the state level um, in Georgia and South Carolina, there have been a number of uh, controversial issues over the last 20 years surrounding things like teacher accountability. Um, you know, you hear the merit pay discussion get brought up um, here and there. So um, you said that you've been teaching for, you said, 42 years? Uh, I've been a teacher or a student for 42 years. I mean, I did K through 12. I have a bachelor's degree in English. I have a master's degree in curriculum instruction and a doctorate in curriculum and instruction. I have taught ESOL overseas. I have been an English teacher 9 through 12 in high school. I've taught everything from remedial classes through advanced placement. And then I went into higher education, and this is my second university. What would you say is your favorite level to teach? There isn't really an answer to that because they're all good and all bad for different reasons. Um, I loved teaching high school because there's this certain wide-eyed wonder with the world still before people start to get jaded when they have to get jobs. But they're a little cynical, though, I would say more, more so than elementary and middle school, certainly. I think middle school is when you first start to see the cynicism creeping yeah, in. Yeah, absolutely, and I 100% agree with that. And I think that has changed a lot. When I first started teaching, it was pre-No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm. It was pre-standardized testing. So there was this still, this level of excitement with education because it wasn't drill and kill all the time. Okay. Excellent. And, well, I'm sorry. And now it's more, it's more drill and kill. Assessment has become education. It is not that about is teaching and learning. It's about delivery and assessment. Okay, and I think that's probably a good place to go into our first commercial break. We'll pick the conversation up right there. This is Jared Gay filling in for Austin Rose, and we will be back after these commercials. 
580, 95.1 FM News Talk, WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. Again, I'm Jared Gay filling in for the vacationing Austin Roads. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800. Toll free from Aiken by dialing 441-TALK, T-A-L-K. That's 441-8255. And for Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. So uh, we're going to pick it back up with Dr. Kemp here. We've got, um, and we will eventually take some calls. Uh, after we've been talking to Dr. Kemp for a while, we'll, we'll give him the opportunity to, to field some calls. And then uh, later in the show, we'll, we'll definitely take some calls as well. Um, if there's something that you feel like we've left out or anything like that, or you want to jump on the air and, and ask a question that you haven't heard me ask, then by all means, uh, call into the radio show, and we will get you on as soon as we can. So uh, going back to talking to Dr. Kemp, so we were talking about kind of the difference between different age levels in terms of the experience of teaching. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were talking about how middle school and high school students are just starting to get enough knowledge of the world where they're getting cynical but don't yet have enough knowledge, most of them anyway, uh, to where they, they feel like they've mastered everything. So mm -hmm. you're not necessarily talking to people who feel like they have it all figured out. Um, so you said that you enjoy teaching high school age students. Mm -hmm. um, how does that inform the way that you teach as a professor of education? Um, okay, that's a, that's a great question. Why, thank you. Absolutely. Um, I, I think one of the big things about it is when I first started in higher ed, I started at Northern Illinois University, and I started immediately teaching in a doctoral program. But my only experience was teaching high school. So I started off teaching in the doctoral program like I was still a high school teacher. Mm -hmm. You know, the type of assignments I gave, the number of assignments that I gave, the kind of feedback that I gave. And it became a learning experience for me because that doesn't work. They're not kids. I mean, half the students were older than I was. But now, looking at it, because I was a public school teacher for 11 years, I do understand what education is, what it was, and what it can be. Like I said, I started off teaching before No Child Left Behind, before standardized testing, and I went into higher ed right as it was going full bore. So I had just hit the point where we were being inundated with assessments and pre-prepared assessments and preparing for tests and reviewing tests. There was a study done by um, a, a, a research group in the South not, quite a few years ago, but it was during the middle of No Child Left Behind. Mm -hmm. I would say probably about 2006 or so. And they said the average school spends about 46% of their school year on testing in some way either giving tests, reviewing for tests, going over tests, preparing for tests, whatever it happens to be about, so that only leaves 54% of the time for new content. Absolutely. You know, which is a little upsetting because if you think about it, the uh, most states say that the um, education system, you get 180 days of education. Mm -hmm. Well, we're not giving 180. days of new education. You know, and those numbers could be off a little bit. All right, well, we're about to go into our second commercial break. Uh, come back and listen to my conversation with Dr. Drew Kemp, who's running for Columbia County Board of Education. We'll pick the conversation up there in just a moment. There it is, with Deke Copenhaver, weekday mornings from 9 to noon on News Talk WGAC. AM 580, 95.1 FM, News Talk WGAC. This is the Austin Rhodes Show. I am not Austin Rhodes. I'm Jared Gay. I'm filling in for Austin while he's on vacation. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800 or toll-free from Aiken by dialing 441-TALK. That's 441-8255. And for Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. Uh, we uh, will take some calls uh, later on in the show uh, after we've been talking to Dr. Kemp for a little while. If you're just tuning in, uh, we're talking to Dr. Drew Kemp. He is a professor at Augusta University, but he is here to talk to us today about his candidacy for Columbia County Board of Education. And so we are going to be talking a little bit, jumping back to uh, before we went on break, uh, one of our mics went out. So just to make sure that we didn't miss anything, we were talking a little bit about the shift from 
kind of what Dr. Kemp was experiencing in education as he was going through school and saying that around the time that he started teaching at the college level was right after the No Child Left Behind bill had passed. And I think right before we went to commercials, you said that you were um, talking about a piece of research that you had read in the South. Yes, um, that particular piece of research just said that about 42, 46 percent of all time in schools is devoted to assessments. I'm in some way, and it could be a classroom test, it could be a quiz, it could be a standardized test, test review, going over a test afterwards, taking tests, which only leaves, you know, 58, 55, 56% of uh, your time on new content, which isn't the 180 days that a public education system is supposed to have. That, that's absolutely right. And I mean, for people who maybe are not, or haven't been in the classroom since they were going through uh, K through 12 or, or college, uh, why? Tell me why that is such a problem in terms of devoting only about half of your class time, a little less than half of your class time, to uh, standardized testing and reviewing that. Um, you know, and it is standardized testing, but it's any testing. We have become so preoccupied with the measurement of people in schools mm -hmm. that we've gotten away from the idea of what an education is supposed to be. An education is supposed to be to help people be well-rounded for a career, for college, for whatever choice they want to make in their life to live the way they choose. So if we only spend time on testable things, we're losing track of things like the arts, theater, music, poetry for the sake of poetry. You know, we've now broken it down to, do you know rhyme and meter? Can you identify iambic pentameter? Mm -hmm. Which, and I apologize to the English teachers out there because I am, an Eng I am an English teacher and I was an English teacher, it doesn't really matter. I can say at 48 years old that not once have I ever felt empty or lonely because I could not identify iambic pentameter. <laughs> I would imagine you're probably pretty good at identifying uh, iambic yes, pentameter. But not once have I ever been put on the spot, you know, and said, okay, the only way you're going to get out of this is can you give me some iambic pentameter? It's just never happened. Yeah. You know, and while I understand the skill set is there to deconstruct language, we've gotten to the point where that's all that we're caring about. You know, and it, it seems to me at least that a lot of the reason that there is now so much focus on, on meter and rhythm and poetry is because in a way it takes a lot of the... I guess, vagueness out of the study of poetry. Uh, people get uncomfortable with things that they feel like are, are more cerebral and are things that, that are more abstract. And there is so much about poetry and reading that is subjective. I think uh, one of the things that probably they're going for with the study of meter is almost kind of reducing poetry to math. It and is, and that's what I mean. Not to We're, speak bad about math. There's nothing bad about math. Okay, I can't say that. I wasn't very good at math. <laughs> um, like, if you figured out my percentages from earlier, I'm sure they were off. But the thing is, is sometimes we need vagueness. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes we need nuance. to not get yeah, nuance and to just not know. You know, if you look at, like, some of the moves and some of the um, new explorations into, like, quantum mechanics, mm -hmm. it throws the idea of physics completely on its head. You know, it is not just you can measure this and this is what it is. You're having to deal with concepts and theories that are beyond something that is purely measurable and goes beyond what we would consider to be logic. You know what, I really like that point. That, that, that's a really good point because there are so many things, especially what, uh, when, when people talk about education for the sake of learning how to do things. I was watching a TED Talk within the last couple of days where I can't remember the speaker's name off the top of my head, um, but they were talking about how creative people oftentimes are people who also procrastinate because it gives them more time when they should be doing the preparatory work to uh, get ready for whatever the deadline is. But that act of procrastinating oftentimes for certain types of procrastinators gives them the time and the mental space to think differently about what it is that they're going to be doing. And with so many, when we talk about teaching students to take a, a step forward in terms of advancing the, the knowledge that we have, especially with areas like science and physics and mm -hmm. things like that. Uh, I really don't know that we are teaching children to be comfortable not knowing things or to use not knowing something as a vehicle or an, an inspiration to find out something that maybe currently isn't known. And you quantum know, mechanics is an excellent example you of know, that. But, but, but along those lines, 
every school, walk into any school and look at their mission and vision statement. Mm -hmm. And they always say creative and critical thinking or critical thinking and creative thinking. However, we don't give people the time to do that. You know, we don't give them, it is, let's do this now. They are now creating curriculum maps where you have to be at this place on this day. And if someone checks on you, you better be at that place on that day. Mm -hmm. Education isn't broken down into 50 minute segments or 10 minute lessons or 12 minute presentations. Sometimes things last longer. Sometimes they're shorter. Sometimes things need to be skipped because something else happened. And the way that we're, we've, cre we've created this education system where we're just trying to make everything lockstep. In my opinion, we are, you know, we say that we're trying to create a liberal arts education. And I don't mean liberal in the political sense. I mean math, science, English, social studies, music, physical education. But I think that's just lip service because really all this assessment culture is doing is creating a school system of conformity and compliance. Well, it also, like you said, I mean, considering that teachers are taking so much of their time uh, rather than teaching new new information, but rather just reviewing or going over a test or preparing for a test, um, I, I think that y you definitely don't see as much, it doesn't allow as much room for uh, creativity either from, or critical thinking from the perspective of the student uh, or from the teacher. And with things like curriculum maps having to, to hit a, a particular point at a, a particular time, um, kind of takes the role of the teacher in a lot of ways out of the equation. And, and for the last few years, I'm sure you've heard a lot of the same things I have about uh, things like Khan Academy, which I think is wonderful, mm -hmm. by the way. But uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Khan Academy, this is a uh, online, I think YouTube originally based um, instructional platform where you could go and watch uh, a teacher or professor go through a lesson um, on the computer, and you can kind of take it at your own pace. This is also a, a new theory of education uh, where they talk about flipping the classroom, meaning that you are sending students home to uh, look over a video usually that, that the teacher has made and giving the time at home where normally they would be doing homework to learning the new information. And then when they come into the classroom, that's when they're doing what normally would be thought of as homework, but they're doing it where the teacher is there and the teacher can help them. Uh, but one of the things that I think you hear a lot of teachers sort of stressed out by because of that is this idea of well, what's going to happen when everything is automated? Are we eventually going to automate education to the degree that the teacher is no longer in the classroom or is no longer an important part of the, the equation? What you do know, you think I, about that? I, well, you know, I think that they're trying to do that. You know, I mean, there are places, I, I believe in Florida, you're required to take an online class. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to, to graduate. I mean, that's a move towards trying to automate our education system. Um, and they're trying to, there's so many things now with testing that schools are bringing in packaged curriculum. So the teachers are no longer profession professionals. You know, if you can read and you can grade, you, you can kind of do the job sometimes. And the thing is, is the vast majority of teachers that I know, and the vast majority of teachers that I have taught, especially you, Jared, of course, um, are, are fantastic at their job. Well, you yeah. know, they are creative people. They have creative thoughts. They are doing wonderful things when they can. Mm -hmm. It's just the when they can is becoming less and less is because as testing becomes more and more. Okay, absolutely. Well, to play devil's advocate a little bit, because I can imagine that there probably are a number of people listening to this who might be thinking, you know, well, that's great. Uh, you know, we do need to teach students to think creatively and all of that. But if we are taking the, the, t the emphasis on testing out of the equation, mm -hmm. then how do we ensure, one, that teachers actually are doing the, the job that we're paying them to do, and two, that the students actually are learning the information that's being covered in the class? Absolutely. I'm not saying to get rid of testing. I, I don't think you can get rid of testing because you do have to know and be able to show those things. But it should be something beyond testing. The thing is, is tests are now the end all and be all of what our schools are. Administrators are measured. Schools are measured. Teachers are measured. Mm -hmm. There was talk a few years ago that the state of Georgia was going to start assessing teacher education programs mm -hmm. by the scores that the student teachers students got on the assessments. Wow. I hadn't even heard about that. Yeah. 
So we have become so obsessed with measuring things that that's all that we're doing. You know, I remember this came from a movie and it, it was a while ago, but you know, I will say having taught in times like this, the students that I had towards the end of my public school career, they were some of the best readers and writers that I had ever had. They could write really well. They, they didn't make that many mistake, mistakes. Their grammar was good. They were clear in what they were saying. It was well organized. They could read and tell me what they read. The problem is they didn't have anything to talk about. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any knowledge of things. You know, they, you, could, you could say, I want you to write an essay about the environment. And they would go look it up and they'd do it about the environment. And then you would ask them about the environment and they couldn't explain it. They could write it clearly, but they were very limited in what it was that they could actually talk about beyond that. And that is what my frustration is, is that we're spending so much time on measuring mm -hmm. and not enough time on people. I think that's, that's an excellent way to, to, to frame it because I know, especially at the college level, you hear, you know, what's the value of a liberal arts education? And, and a lot of times they will, um, you know, people will say, well, it puts you in contact and in communication with uh, different disciplines that maybe you wouldn't otherwise expose yourself to, different people you wouldn't otherwise necessarily meet, and that so much of the value of going to a college, a four-year university for, for a bachelor's degree is that the, the, the moment that you're sitting in a classroom hearing the professor or another student express an opinion about something you've just read in the class and, and thinking, well, wait, though, I remember also hearing this other thing, and I remember kind of having this, this previous view on this issue, but it, even at the public school level, even if you know, you're a high school or middle school or even elementary school teacher, if you're not giving as much time in the classroom to bringing up new material for the sake of bringing up new material or having discussions for the sake of having discussions, then even if they can reproduce mechanically what the teacher has been teaching them in class, it's not necessarily going to be something that uh, thinks creatively or, or adds to the question. You know, we'll be talking a little bit about improv and, and that in a moment, but improv is, uh, uh, the philosophy behind improv, the two main words in improv, uh, improvisational theater, is uh, they're yes and. You know, the idea that you accept an offer that's made on stage from a teammate, yes, and then you add something of value to it to keep the, keep the scene moving forward. So if somebody says, you know, man, it's, it's a really rainy day outside today, you know, that would be the offer that they're giving you. So your responsibility then as the other actor on stage is to accept that reality. Yes, it is raining and add something of value. Uh, I can't believe that I forgot to bring my umbrella. We need to run and get under that tree before it starts really pouring. And so in that case, you've got something that is being added to the conversation. But it sounds like what you're saying is that your concern is that if you are not giving enough time in the classroom to bringing up new information, to studying things for the sake of furthering a discussion or having a discussion just for that sake, that they're not they're able to do the yes, but they're not able to do the and. That is an excellent way of saying that. that that's exactly what it is. You know, they can agree. They can do what you tell them to do. Mm -hmm. And like I said, we're making it so they can conform and they can be compliant. We're able to tell them what to do, when to do it, how to do it, and what do they do? They do it when we say how to do it and when to do it. I mean, that's exactly what is going on. But the second you release them to do something creative, well, then they need a rubric. Can you give me an example? Can you show me something that I, that'll help me do this? We've taken away that ability to think abstractly mm -hmm. because everything has become so tangible. Okay, so uh, we're about to go into our next commercial break. Um, this is, let's see, what time is it? Uh, 3.50, all right. So uh, we're going to be taking a break to go into our news. Jared Gay talking to Dr. Kim. See you in a moment. I'm Jared Gay filling in for the vacationing Austin Roads. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800. Or call toll free from Aiken by dialing 441 TALK. That's 441 8255. And for Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. Again, I'm Jared Gay. I'm uh, filling in for Austin. We're going to be talking about uh, uh, several topics over the course of the next few hours, but for the at least the next uh, foreseeable 
couple of uh, commercial breaks, we're going to be talking to Dr. Drew Kemp, who, again, if you just are tuning in, is running for Columbia County Board of Education. And we were kind of talking about the the emphasis on, on testing, especially standardized testing, and, and kind of how we can go about, in terms of our education system, returning to a place where we were giving students the space to be creative, think critically about the things that are covered in class, and kind of give them the ability to add to the conversation, not only to be able to reproduce something that's shown to them. The example um, I was about to give was it's almost like imagining, and you can agree or disagree with me here, Dr. Kemp, but um, I would say it's almost like what you're describing is imagining a chef who is only ever following recipes as yeah. opposed to creating a dish. Exactly, and you know, there are restaurants like that. Mm -hmm. You know, and you go, you know what to expect, and you get it, and you leave satisfied. You got what you expected. Mm -hmm. But it's those restaurants that people talk about where you walk in and you take that bite and you're like, oh my gosh, I could actually die right now because I have now had the most pleasurable food on the planet. Mm -hmm. um, that is, that's the difference. You know, we're not creating those memorable bites. We're not creating those meals that are talked about. We're creating the recipe meals that then you can take the recipe home and do it yourself and you can replicate it and you can replicate it and you can replicate it, but that's all you're going to do is replicate it. Okay. All right. I mean, I think that makes a lot of sense. It's probably easy for, for people to understand kind of what, what you're getting at there. Um, and the reason that we kind of started talking about that was because uh, I was playing devil's advocate a little bit and saying, well, if we are no longer going to be focusing pretty much exclusively on testing as the end-all be-all for, for assessment, for tracking how a student is performing in school or how well a teacher is doing at teaching the information that they're hired to teach, that how can we make sure that those things are happening? And, and like you said, uh, you're not – doesn't sound like you're talking about doing away with testing entirely. No, not but, at all. but not – I'm, I'm talking about – finding other ways to measure success in school. It doesn't have to be a number. It doesn't have to be a percentage. It doesn't have to be in a certain standard deviation. There are many ways that we can measure what is going on in school besides that. And because that is our only measure, and that is what controls funding, and that is what controls the curriculum, and that's what controls instruction, and that's what controls the administrators, that's all that we're ever gonna get. So then. What are some of those other um, assessment opportunities? Uh, whenever you talk about other ways that we are... All right, uh, yeah, we're about, sorry, we're about to go into our uh, next commercial break. Uh, when we come back, we'll uh, pick it back up with Dr. Drew Kemp uh, running for Columbia County Board of Education and talk a little bit more about after we change what we change, what's, what's that going to look like? What are you actually advocating for? AM 580, 95.1 FM News Talk, WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. I'm Jared Gay, filling in for the vacationing Austin Roads. You can, as always, reach us by dialing 706-863-5800. Toll free from Aiken by dialing 441-TALK, T-A-L-K. That's 441-8255. And for Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. Um, if you are waiting to get on the air, uh, we, we're going to spend a little bit more time talking to uh, my guest that I'm currently speaking with, and I'll reintroduce him in just a moment. But uh, we definitely will, after we've been talking, maybe towards the end of the hour, we'll, we'll take a, a couple of calls. And if you have something else that you want to talk about not related to the conversation, uh, we'll also take some calls during the last hour of the show. Um, again, my name is Jared Gay, and uh, came on to talk about a, a – kind of un, unexplored or underexplored um, avenue in, in terms of what you're normally used to hearing on the air. Um, I do self-identify as a progressive, definitely not uh, as conservative an individual as you are accustomed to hearing uh, every day at this time. But I've come on a number of times to talk to Austin about a number of political issues. I've always gotten along really well with them on the air and off the air for that matter. And uh, really looking forward to getting into uh, all the things that we have to talk about today. We, of course, have a couple of local candidates coming on to talk, uh, including the one I'm about to speak with. And we're going to continue that conversation here momentarily. And then uh, last couple of hours of the show, we'll also be talking about some local political issues having, or more partisan issues having to do with the Richmond County Democratic Party. But either way, if you self-identify as a progressive or a liberal or a Republican or a conservative or a libertarian, the fact is, if you can hear my voice right now, we are quite literally on the same frequency. So I hope that you'll uh, give everything a fair shot, and I think that we're going to have a lot of fun. So let's continue this conversation. 
So, uh, talking to Dr. Kemp, again, if you're just tuning in, he is a candidate for Columbia County Board of Education, and he has been working in education for a number of decades. Before we uh, went to the break, we were talking a little bit about what the current sta uh, status, I guess, is with education, the emphasis on testing, uh, the teacher accountability movement, and talking about a lot of the shortcomings of that, you know, teaching students how to do things, but not necessarily giving them the tools to think creatively or to uh, introduce new ideas. Uh, to their analysis. And so the question that I had put to you, Dr. Kemp, uh, before we went to break was, okay, we pretty well identified what the shortcomings are of, of focus on teacher accountability and testing. Um, you said about half of the time is, is spent working on testing, not necessarily teaching new material. Uh, and I guess the question then would be, well, what, what do we do to fix that? What kind of an education system would you like to see um, in Columbia County, in Georgia, or statewide, or nationwide? Absolutely. Um, and to be honest, do I have a, a hard and fast answer to that? No, I don't. Because part of what a school board is is about the conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, it is a group of people that are getting together for the good of the students wherever it happens to be. Here it happens to be Columbia County. Different states, it's different. Illinois, there'd have to be a thousand school districts in Illinois because you can have a school district for, even for a single school that has its own school board. Mm -hmm. And it's about the conversation. Do I have ideas? Absolutely. I have ideas because I've been in education as a teacher or student for my entire life with the exception of one year when I worked for my father at a gas station. So. I, I think that having someone in education for the conversations is important. Um, I, I've done a number of studies and a, 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 quite a bit of research, and nationally, the composition of school boards is typically about 24% of the people on school boards have a background in education. About wow. one out of every four. The things they count is a background in education, being president of the PTO, being a substitute teacher mm -hmm. and volunteering at schools. Those all count. None of which require a teacher certification. No, they don't. And I'm not saying it, you, you have to be a, a teacher certification to be on a school board. However, if you look at the American Bar Association, mm -hmm. those are lawyers. If you look at the American Medical Association, those are doctors. Mm -hmm. If you look at the engineering boards, those are engineers. Only in education do we have governing bodies that make decisions for students that don't have a background in education. And because of that, in my opinion, and I, and I, I hate using the word this way because I have nothing against this word, it's making parts of the teaching profession into a teaching vocation. It's okay. become different. Teachers are professionals. They have degrees. Many have advanced degrees. They have advanced training. Mm -hmm. They spend a lot of time learning to better themselves at their craft. So on a school board, I think we need people besides people that are lawyers and business people and engineers and scientists. We need people with a background in education to have conversations about education. I think, I mean, I think that's a fair point. Um, and again, it doesn't sound like you're saying that those other vocations no. or professions don't have a role. It is a public education system, and the community needs to have a voice there, but not the only voice there. And because of that, back to your question. Mm -hmm. Sorry for that uh, little um, it's all good. distraction there. Um, do I have any answers? Yeah, there are things that I think should be done, but in no way is it my decision. There are five people on the school board. It is for a discussion. Mm -hmm. And there is another idea that's out there that isn't used all that often. And I know some people are going to hear this word and immediately going to be turned off. And if so, that's going to happen. Um, it's the idea of the activist school board member. Okay. It is instead of the person that votes yes or no on the budget and field trips and, you know, punishments and recognizing someone for winning an award, it's a school board that actively tries to make the education system better not just by okaying things, but by generating things. Okay. So is that the kind of voice that you think you would bring to the school yes. board then? Is, uh, that, that would be my intention. Okay. To, to, to do that. To make the schools less... To convince people that schools don't just need to be measured on test scores. 
we need to find alternative ways of showing the community and the world that the schools and the teachers are doing a good job. Do I know what those are right now? No, I don't. Because part of that are the other people on the school board, part of those are the administrators, part of those are the people that work in the school district. But it's a conversation that needs to be had instead of just minimalizing education like we have over the past decade. Well, for people who are maybe not used to following what the Board of Education is doing, mm -hmm. um, what there is a limit, I, I would think, to how much you can reform at a county level considering how much education policy is set at the state level in the legislature. Absolutely, but there are certain day-to-day -day things that you can do. I, you know, school districts do make some decisions on their own. Um, recently, and this at one point was good, ended up not being so good. It was in Fort Myers, Florida. Admittedly, it's a different state. But the school board was tired of all the testing, and they voted to stop. Just we're, like that? We're, we're just not going to do it anymore. And there was something in the state legislature that although it said, test, they go, we'll give the test. We're just not going to use them to measure our schools like that anymore. We, and the state can't, couldn't cut funding to the district. It was a two, I think the three person school board and it was two to one. Mm -hmm. No, it was five and it was three to. A bunch of people started complaining. Well, then how are we going to know before they could do anything? How are we going to know how schools are doing? And they revoted and overturned it. But it's those little steps you know, people that are willing to challenge the status quo that we need. In education, education is cyclical. We go through different cycles where it can be very open, like the 1970s. When I was in elementary school in the 1970s, we had, um, I, I went to a school without walls. My, wow. ele my elementary school, all of the students in the first grade were all in the same room, all the classes. There were portable walls you could put up for different subjects, but it was just one room. Second grade was the same way. However, prior to that, it was much different. That's when there was a lot of reading, writing, writing science, and math. In 1957, Sputnik. You mm -hmm. know, all of a sudden, we were falling behind. We had to do that. And then all of a sudden, we had all these students that could do those things and were creative. So then the 60s and 70s came along, and all of a sudden, it was the explosion of electives. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden, we had all of these people that had all of these ideas, but they couldn't spell, and they couldn't write. People were like, electives, we can't have that. Electives meaning things like um, you know, drama, music, yes, classes absolutely. that are normally not part of the core curriculum. Right. Um, thank you. Um, and then people were like, oh, well, now they can't read and write. They can't do basic math. So we swung back the other way, and all of a sudden, it was, we have to only teach reading, writing, and math again. And all of a sudden, we have people that can read and write and do math, but they have nothing to talk about again. And because it swings like this, it's gonna take someone or somewhere to say, look, our students are more important than being a number. Mm -hmm. Our students are people that have a future and we need to change that. I went through school before there was testing, didn't really hinder me at all. So we need to rethink what's being done. I don't know what that will look like, but something needs to be done. And we we spent a lot of time talking about the uh, what I call the what a lot of people call the accountability movement. And uh, for those of you who aren't really as familiar with education policy, if you're not a teacher, you don't really follow things like this that closely. Uh, when we say the accountability movement, we mean a, a movement, a, a philosophical movement uh, within the the education system, um, nationally and internationally, of people saying, well what is the best way to assess how successful our schools are? And with the accountability movement, it's a focus um, on teacher accountability specifically. And so when we talk about test scores and the accountability movement, that's oftentimes, I mean, for years now, especially since No Child Left Behind, that's the primary way that teachers um, professionally were being assessed, you know, on, on how good they were at teaching. Uh, and so whenever we talk about wanting to shift away from accountability, we don't mean taking, you know, necessarily taking away all of the, uh, all the guidelines or, or all of the uh, assessment vehicles that allow us to, to determine how successful schools are, but maybe taking the focus away from being so exclusively on test scores is that that only method. Um, yeah, so we, uh, I know we're about to go into a, another commercial break here in just a moment, but uh, whenever we come back, we'll uh, keep this conversation going, talk a little bit more about the school board, and then... Um, open it up and, and use that to maybe take some uh, calls, see if uh, folks have some questions they want to ask you about what you would do as a Board of Education member. 580, 95.1 FM. 
FM News Talk WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. I'm Jared Gay filling in for the Vacationing Austin Roads. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800, toll free from Aiken on 441-TALK, 441-8255. And if you're a Verizon subscriber, you can just dial star 580 and we can uh, get you on the air. And we'll, we'll start taking calls a little bit later in the uh, we'll not too much later in the hour, but I uh, wanted to kind of wrap up the conversation that we were having with Dr. Kemp and talk about some things that we haven't quite touched on yet. So again, speaking with Dr. Kemp, a professor at Augusta University, who's also a candidate for the Columbia County Board of Education. And um, as we went to break, we were kind of talking about how a, a, a board of education is not like most other boards, uh, like the Bar Association, for example, tends to be all lawyers, uh, whereas a board of education, a lot of times, um, I think you use the number 24 percent. Something like that. That's yeah. one of the last numbers that I so, saw. But, you know, but right at a quarter of people currently serving on boards of education across the country are people from an actual education background. And if you were listening to uh, the conversation during the first hour of the show, we were talking uh, pretty extensively about Dr. Kemp's um, education background. He's, he said he worked in education for about 40 years, 42 years, and is now for the first time getting involved in a direct way by running for the Columbia County Board of Education. So um, we, we talked a little bit about, we said that 24% number nationally, but do, do you know how many current Columbia County Board of Education members are from an education background? You know, the, the information about the current Board of Education there isn't really posted anywhere. You have to do a little research on it. Mm -hmm. From what I can tell, aside from experience on the school board itself, I think it's one. I think okay. one out of the five. Out of five. Out of five mm -hmm. has a background in education. If I am wrong, I do apologize for that. Um, but there aren't, there used to be posted bios of each person on the school board. I can't find them anywhere. I looked in the same place I did before, mm -hmm. so I did a search and I found old news articles and the way they were described. And I saw a lawyer, um, someone that works for, I believe, SRS, um, someone that is a self-described business person, a couple of those, and then there's one person that has a background in education that was an administrator, I believe. Okay. All right, and, and so, I mean, really then what you're saying, Columbia County would be a little bit lower than the national average if that number was 24%. Yeah, but it, it, when I get voted in, it'll be higher because then it'll be 40%. There you go. And uh, we have, of course, uh, uh, several controversial issues that um, come about in the national conversation surrounding education. Um, you know, I wanted to touch on some of those so that the listeners could get an idea of what your what your actual input, what kind of input they can they can rely upon you for, you know, to, to determine what philosophical stance you're coming from. Um, now, of course, these are non nonpartisan board positions, correct? correct? Yeah, it's a nonpartisan election. So you're not running as a Democrat or I Republican or anything like that. Okay. Well, how would you describe? I guess. Well, let's tell you what. Let's uh, let's let's take one of the issues that's been in the news uh, for the last couple of years and and kind of get your take on that, and maybe that can help frame what perspective you'd be coming from on the Board of Education. Uh, the the issue of transgender students in bathrooms. Oh. Um, North Carolina had a big issue about this, and then the Texas up. Texas is doing it right now. And when we say doing it, we mean are there? We mean that they're trying to ban transgender students from using the bathroom of their gender. Okay, so I'm going to play devil's advocate here a little bit because I, I would imagine that we probably see eye to eye. Okay, we're going to be going to break in about one minute, but we'll pick it up uh, whenever we come back. But yeah, he, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, we probably do see eye to eye on this, but I'm, I'm going to kind of play a devil's advocate a little bit and, and find out why, one, this is an issue that you as a Board of Education member would care about, why, why it would be important to you, and then kind of where you're coming from on that issue. And maybe we can get um, a little bit later in the hour some folks to call in and share their thoughts on it or pose some questions to you as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so, uh, yeah, we'll be picking up that conversation here in just a moment. Again, Jared Gay interviewing Dr. Kemp from Augusta University, candidate for Columbia County Board of Education. All right, AM 580, 95.1 FM News Talk, WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. I'm Jared Gay, filling in for Austin while he's on vacation. You can uh, reach us always at 706-863-5800, toll free from Aiken at 441-TALK, uh, that's 441-8255, and Verizon Wireless customers by dialing star 580. Again, this is Jared Gay talking to Professor Drew Kemp, who is a candidate for the Columbia County Board of Education and also a uh, 
member of the education profession for going on five decades now. And so we uh, we're talking before we went to the break. Uh, we Matt, wait, wait, wait. You didn't have what? to say it like that. I rounded up. I definitely rounded up. He said 42 years. I, I, I rounded it up to 50. Um, he's very, very bald, though. Like, you should, you should know this. Uh, if you saw him, it, it, it's, not, it's not entirely unfair. I would say that I shave it, but if I don't shave it, yeah, still a pretty apt description. <laughs> he's got a pretty uh, full beard, though, a goatee. So it's not, he's not completely incapable of growing hair on his head, just on top of his head. There you go. So if that's important to you. I can a, totally do the Hulk Hogan thing. You should absolutely do the whole thing. Okay, not body-wise, but definitely the hair. Uh -huh. I could definitely do that. Yeah, the total bald, long hair in the back. And if you wear a bandana, then you can actually get away with it even more. Yeah, I should. So, okay, <laughs> we were talking about, uh, we're trying to get an idea of, uh, and we're going to, in this next segment, we're, we're going to be on for about 15 minutes before we go to our next uh, news break. And I, I wanted to kind of wrap up the conversation uh, about the Board of Education and kind of where you sit politically and um, open it up to a few callers. So if anybody out there is interested in talking to Dr. Kemp and asking him some questions about his uh, positions on education policy or just asking us some questions about anything that you've heard us talking about, uh, feel free to call in. We'll also take calls in the last hour for some other things that we're gonna be talking about for the next couple of hours. And here in a few minutes, I'm gonna get um, somebody else who's coming to the studio to hop on a mic and uh, join the conversation. And I'll introduce him in just a moment. But right before we went to break, we were talking about transgender students. We were talking about education policy and what would what your perspective would be coming to the education uh, coming to the board of education. Mm -hmm. So in the case of transgender students, um, there's been a lot of controversy about which bathroom should they use, should they be allowed to use the bathroom of the gender they identify with, or should they be um, made to use the bathroom that corresponds with their uh, sexual gender, their, their biological gender, or uh, should schools kind of take the third option and make all bathrooms um, non-gender specific is another way that some schools have, ch have chosen to handle it. Um, the question I was about to put to you, because I'm playing devil's advocate here, I, I probably will agree with what you're going to say, but for the sake of argument, uh, what would you say to people who, who would ask the question, why is this an issue that people in the United States, teachers and uh, Board of Education members should care about? Okay, that's really not the question I was expecting you to ask. Okay. Um, no, that's fine. Because the idea of a public education is it is a public education for all people. Mm -hmm. We have programs for gifted students, for special needs students, for learning disabilities. We have, um, we have sports for athletes. We have programs for STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. Mm -hmm. We have programs for all kinds of subject areas, all kinds of abilities. But when it comes down to sexuality and gender, immediately it makes people uncomfortable. And we are telling that group of people, which is a significant portion of the population, mm -hmm. that they're not okay, that they are different, and the public education system isn't there for them. So I think that our education system should be there for all students, regardless of their sex or their gender or their sexuality, or their race, or ethnicity, or ability, or anything. We need to be there for all students. And because of that, you know, if you look at like the statistics that are out there, how many times in a bathroom at a public school that someone who identifies as one gender that is not their biological gender goes in the wrong, that it's ever been something bad has happened except for to that person. I mean, are all these people up in arms to protect the transgender community? I don't think they are. It's because it's something they don't understand, and it's something that they've been taught is wrong. Okay. I mean, I do think that's an important point to make because I think one of the ways that you hear this conversation framed is in terms of, well, what, you know, who would want a, uh, you know, a person who's biologically a man going uh, to the same bathroom as, you know, your, your daughter? or you know your your wife or you if you're a female you know that, that there's this the implication is that they would be the perpetrator potentially of some violent crime taking place in a bathroom uh because of the difference in biological gender but the point that you were bringing up is that um transgender individuals oftentimes are the victims of Absolutely. violence rather than the perpetrators of violence almost always i mean sure i'm sure there are cases you know someone can post oh here's an example well one example isn't evidence it's just an example mm -hmm. um 
And the thing is, is I think it makes people uncomfortable because it is something that you can identify with your eyes. You know, if someone is gay or lesbian, if someone that is gay goes into a male bathroom, mm -hmm. you don't know that they are gay. So no one questions it. Okay. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, but if they're transgender, you can say, uh-oh, wrong, wrong biological gender in this bathroom. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing. It's just because you can identify it and it makes people feel uncomfortable. Okay. People need to get over it. So it does sound then like the perspective that you would bring to the Board of Education would be more of a, a liberal, which you think that's a yeah, very to use, a liberal perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, with Columbia County being such a predominantly uh, conservative county in terms of how they vote, Republican. Absolutely. Uh, do you – how do you plan to assuage the concerns of people who would, might say – this guy doesn't think like I do, and therefore I don't want him representing Columbia County students. You know, the, he's the minority uh, viewpoint in this county, mm -hmm. so why should I vote for him to go advance that viewpoint when it's one that I just inherently disagree with? Yeah, that's a fear I have every day. Mm -hmm. that, you know, once people get to know me more, they're going to say, I don't want him there because he doesn't think like me. But do you only want people that think like you? You know, it's a board of five people. It comes down to a vote. Okay. There needs to be a dissenting opinion. Otherwise, nothing would ever change. You know, if you always have people saying, "Oh yes, we all agree and move on," mm -hmm. then nothing can progress. Groupthink. Yes, but we we need to overcome. Perfect word for it. We need to overcome that groupthink. We need someone to at least ask the questions mm -hmm. that make people realize there are different points of view. Because the public education system shouldn't be about one point of view. So if you're listening to this conversation and if you can hear us talking, then um, like I said a little while ago, we are quite literally on the same frequency. So um, if you're tuning into the show right now, by this point, you've gotten an idea of what our political alignment is, and it's not what you normally are used to hearing on the Austin Road show. Um, I self-identify as a progressive. Uh, Dr. Kemp just said he self-identifies as a liberal. But if you're still listening to the show, then to an extent, that means that you do value finding out what other people's views are and giving a fair hearing to those views, you know, whenever people are communicating in a, in a respectful and decent way. So that's something that I, I, I think probably should be important to anybody, regardless of what your political views are, that you do want people in an organization that you care about expressing a minority viewpoint so that people don't automatically assume that the group already has everything figured out. And if I can say, you know, yes, I, I probably disagree with a great many people in the county about that. But that doesn't mean I know less about education. Mm. It doesn't mean that I don't know what good educational practice is or good educational policy is. It just means politically I might not agree with you on things. And it's clear, I mean, from the conversation that you know a great deal about educational policy. You know, this is something that you can tell by hearing you talk that you're very knowledgeable about it, you're very passionate about it. And so that's something that, you know, I, I hope that you are able to get people to at least give you a fair hearing in terms of finding out, well, what actually are, are his views and why should I potentially value having somebody on a board of education where my kids go to school that I don't see eye to eye with? Um, because, again, even if you succeeded, you'd be one of five. So mm -hmm. it's not like you'd be able to dictate to no, the school board what not. your positions are, what their positions would be. You know, along those lines, I was having a Facebook conversation on the Facebook page for uh, my campaign. Mm -hmm. And... One of my Facebook friends on there is quite conservative. We we're having a conversation about it. He wanted to know what I believed. And he ended up saying, okay, we really pretty much don't agree about anything. Mm -hmm. But that isn't necessarily a problem. It is a school board. You know, there are other people in the conversation also. And just because you think that way doesn't mean that I wouldn't vote for you if I think you're good for education. Okay. And I think that's that's especially important considering, like we were saying a little while ago, that this is a nonpartisan race. You know, I mean, it's a nonpartisan position to, to be on the Board of Education. So um, I do hope that people will kind of evaluate you based on your your knowledge that you can bring to bear on the Board of Education and the, the appreciation for the fact that you do want to encourage a more complete conversation uh, around these topics. Um, Okay, so we pretty much covered everything that I wanted to talk. Was there anything uh, – we're going to take it, take some calls here in just a minute. Uh, we'll be going to break in about five minutes. But uh, was there anything that we haven't really quite touched on yet that you wanted to bring up? Um, only that I am invested in Columbia County Schools. 
I have one daughter that just graduated from high school in Columbia County, and I have another one that will be a junior next year. Okay. So this, I am not a person that is on the outside looking in. I am invested in it through my children. All of my students are teachers in the CSRA with a great number of them in Columbia County, and I've taught student teachers that are there too. So um, I, I am not just someone that's out there as a voice. I am out there as a voice that is involved on multiple levels. Okay, so, so again, so it's not uh, you coming with an outside perspective and, and no connection to the community. In addition to having connection to education, you've got a great deal of connection yes. to the community um, in terms of family. Um, and in terms of, of the time that you've spent teaching uh, many of the teachers who do teach in Columbia and Richmond County. Um, so we're going to take some calls here in just a minute. I know we've had a few people uh, waiting on the air for quite a long time. So uh, we, we'll take a call or two, uh, try to talk for a couple of minutes, and then uh, we'll be going to break. When we come back, we're going to introduce uh, Mr. Joey Trana, a friend of mine who's coming on to um, talk to us about another candidate who hopefully will be calling in uh, shortly. So let's go ahead and take our first call. I know we've got um, Joel and Evans has been waiting for a while, so let me go ahead and cue him up. All right, Joel, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. Hey, Joel, what can I do for you? Uh, so uh, I just want to ask Dr. Kemp about some issue that's been going on uh, in a, the colleges here, the uh, free speech uh, issue that's been uh, uh, sort of been uh, going around the uh, with regards to uh, students protesting certain speakers that they disagree with. And, I wonder what your take on this is, and also in your resume, I think you, uh, Jared mentioned that you were uh, social justice, you, you identify with social justice, and this, these sort of anti free speech movements also identify as. Can you define your terms real quick as to what you think social justice is? Okay, okay. Um, in, sure. In, in no particular, let me take the first half of that first. As people protesting speakers, I have no problem with people protesting speakers on either side. Um, I think that is a right that we have. People have a right to speak. And if there was a speaker that was there that I disagreed with, I would probably protest it also. However, if it was someone that I wanted to hear, I would attend. But I would expect if you disagree with the speaker, you have a right to say that you disagree with the speaker. You can protest, you can hold up sign, you can disagree. You can post to the rants and raves on the Augusta Chronicle and say how horrible that it is. But because we all have the right to do that. What I do not condone, however, is the violence that goes along with it. Yeah. A lot of these have turned into violence. And if you look, the violence is usually done by a small group that are there just for the violence. They aren't necessarily there for the speaker or for either group. They are there just to cause trouble. And I do not condone that at all. So you said you, you agree with protesting. I do. Um, do you, uh, I guess, agree with the impetus of responding to a, a speaker that you don't like by trying to get the university to not have that speaker come and talk? Um, to be honest, no, I do not. Okay. Um, you know, it can be someone that I totally disagree with, but I believe those voices have a right to be heard because honestly, it's a large part of the population and you need to be able to have a dialogue and understand the other side to better understand your own point of view. Okay. Um, Joel, was there anything else? Oh, so yeah, Justice, oh, the social, social justice warrior definition. Yeah, so what exactly do you want to know about social justice? Because in no way am I about muting anyone's voice. Okay, I am not for hate speech, you know? I, I said that I would not be opposed to someone with an opposing point of view speak on anything. If the person is there purely to say things that are racist, misogynistic, homophobic, and that is the only message to put down marginalized groups, I don't have, a, I, I'm not okay with that. Because that is a form of violence to me. It doesn't have to be physical to be violence. But as far as social justice goes, we need to live in a just society where everyone gets equitable treatment. All and right. I'm not saying equal treatment, but equitable treatment. All right. Well, thank you, Joel, and thank you, Dr. Kemp. Uh, we'll try to talk a little bit more to that when we come back. We're about to go to our next commercial break. Again, Jared Gay filling in for Austin Rhodes. Five eighty ninety five point one News Talk WGAC Austin Road Show. This is Jared Gay filling in for Austin while he's on vacation. You can call us at eight seven zero six eight six three five eight hundred. Toll free from Aiken four four one T A L K eight two five five. 
and Verizon Wireless customers dial star 580. So uh, for the last couple of hours, we've been talking to Dr. Drew Kemp. He's a candidate for the Columbia County Board of Education. And uh, we were just talking a little bit here at the end about um, uh, about the, the term social justice warrior, and uh, we just took a call from Joel. But uh, we're about to transition um, into kind of the next segment of what we brought to talk. So uh, Dr. Kemp, was there anything else that you wanted to, to bring up before we um, move on and start talking about another local race? Absolutely. Um, just briefly, and you know, I don't want to take up any more of your time. I've appreciated being on here. Thank you all for your patience. Um, Thank you for coming out. I, I, of course, I want everyone to vote for me. So when it comes up, please do. Um, it's May 22nd, 2018. But more importantly, go out and vote. Even if you don't vote for me, make your voice heard. You know, in the last election, what, 50% of the people in the country didn't vote? Mm -hmm. You know, votes matter. Um, democracy isn't easy and you need to participate. You know, you need to be a part of the process. And if you're not voting, you're not part of the process. So no matter what your views are or what you believe, go out and vote. You know, make that voice heard because that is what this country is built on. And that is, that's what's important, is to go out and vote. So do I want you to vote for me? Absolutely. Do I, would I rather you go out and vote? Yes. I would rather you vote for someone, most of all, because we need people to participate in, our, in, in, in the process and be an active member of this democracy. All right. Well, if people want to find out more about you and your candidacy, uh, how can they do so? Absolutely. Um, I, I have a website. It's Andrew T. Kemp, K -E -M -P .com, Andrew T. Kemp .com. You can pretty much access everything on there. There's a link to a Facebook page. There's a link to if you, you know, if you feel motivated to donate, uh, there's a place for you to do that. And there is a blog with different topics that I have talked about over time that I kind of go in spurts. I'll, I'll write two or three in a row, and then I'll wait a couple of weeks, and I'll put some in there. Um, and a lot of them are based on conversations that I have. You know, someone brought something up, so I leave it at that. Excellent. AndrewTKemp.com, uh, and we'll uh, plug that again at the end of the show. Thank you for coming on. Um, I'm going to bring on – we've got about one more minute before we go to our next commercial break. But whenever we come back, we are going to be talking with Joe Trana. And he is going to be talking to us about the District 12 election, and we've got somebody who's going to be coming on to make an announcement about that. So stay tuned. We've got a lot of big things coming up, and we will talk to you about this in just a moment. Joey, you can go ahead and um, get your headset on if you want. And uh, as soon as we get back from commercial, we will talk a little bit about that and then see if we can get a uh, friend of ours to call in and make an important announcement. Jared Gay, filling in for Austin Rhodes. Give us a call. We'll put you on the last hour. This is the Austin Road Show. I'm Jared Gay filling in for the vacation in Austin. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800 or toll-free from Aiken by uh, dialing 441-TALK. That's 441-8255. And for Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. So, uh, again, this is the progressive takeover of WGAC for today. Austin was kind enough to invite me to come on and host the show while he's out of town. And we wanted to give kind of a, a slightly different perspective on, uh, on WGAC from what you normally hear uh, during this time. And uh, we spent the first couple of hours talking to a local candidate, uh, Dr. Kemp, who's running for Board of Education. Um, he had to leave so that he can go teach a class. Uh, he's still actively involved in education. And we uh, are going to transition to talking about something that uh, the people I have in the studio with me now have been passionately working alongside uh, yours truly in the trenches with uh, local politics and local political issues. Those of you who are regular listeners of the show who have heard me on before have heard me talk extensively about the Richmond County, um, the Democratic Party in Richmond County, uh, RCDC and uh, some of the difficulties that local and younger progressives have had um, trying to get involved with the party. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce a few folks who have come down to talk uh, with me about this. 
First of all, we have Joe Traina. Joe? Yeah. All right. Excited, man. Let's do it. Uh, we also have Thomas Moss. Hello. And Monica martinez Canty. Hey, guys. So uh, these are all fellow members of a group that uh, we're all members of a group called Progressives for Democratic Reform. And uh, Joey, or whoever wants to jump on, uh, tell us a little bit about, tell me about what we've been doing together. Uh, well, we have uh, definitely been opening up people's eyes uh, over the last couple months. So over this last year, folks have come to realize that uh, business as usual has been getting us nowhere. Um, and I think, uh, Jared, you're probably, you've probably been maybe one of the, well, we've all been surrogates, I think, to, to our own, you know, uh, uh, you know, part of the community here in, in trying to reform what already exists, but also energize and get more people involved because more eyes and ears and legs on it, I think, I think we agree will actually bring improvement. Uh, we've made a lot of friends, a lot of new friends, a lot of folks have been drawn in actually, um, to the action and, um, uh, and that's, uh, that's indicative, I think, of something that's happening all over the state, all over the region, all over the country. Uh, and we're just, we're just that, uh, that local flash. But uh, okay, yeah, so before, I, before I get into the next thing I'm really excited about, um, yeah, we got, we got Monica and Thomas over here. I mean, All right. Well, uh, <laughs> we, can go ahead, we can go ahead and bring them into it uh, to, to give a little background on what Joey was saying. Uh, PDR, Progressive Democratic Reform, is a group that started immediately after the election in uh, November of 2016. And uh, the purpose of our group was to become members of the Richmond County Democratic Party and try to push the party in a more progressive direction, whatever that wound up meaning once we got there and got an idea of what was going on. But uh, Monica, well, maybe you can talk a little bit to some of the things that we've encountered um, going as far back as November. Yeah, well, I got involved um, in December. I linked up with uh, Joey um, via Facebook and realized that we did have a local party that I could get um, involved in. So I attended the December meeting. It was kind of chaotic. I had no idea what was going on. Um, there were a lot of issues as far as membership were was concerned and it concerned me as far as the party goes. Um, we had obviously just lost a major election and um, I could kind of see why. So uh, mm -hmm. we were having issues with people um, being allowed to become members. Um, they were not welcoming at all. Uh, so that kind of motivated all of us who, a lot of us didn't really know each other before this to really bond together and um, create a group to take on the party and have our voices heard. Okay, and um, full disclosure, uh, we, I mean, we have had some success in doing that. Um, uh, initially, there was a very concerted effort on the part of the executive committee back then, and I, I'm not afraid to, to say who we're talking about. We're talking about Lowell Greenbaum, who was the chairman of the Democratic Party for the last 16 years. Um, those of you who have not already seen the video, if you go to the Progressives for Democratic Reform Facebook page, there are several videos on there of some of the meetings that we have attended, starting with the very first one we attended back in November where uh, Lowell Greenbaum stormed across the room, screamed at us, got in Joey's face uh, personally, and uh, threatened to call the police if we didn't leave. Of course, this was a public meeting, and so I think uh, you, know, you guys can speak to this too, but I think what we've seen over and over is – the executive committee, and of course now Lowell Greenbaum is chairman emeritus, the sitting chair is uh, Matessa Wright, uh, but seeing the executive committee take deliberate actions out of step with what the, the, the bylaws dictate in terms of how to hold elections, how to handle membership, uh, what their responsibilities are to their committee. And I know Joey said this several times in a lot of the live feeds that he and I have done together on Facebook that we probably would not be right now sitting here talking about the Richmond County Democratic Party, especially not in the way that we're talking about it, if we had been welcomed whenever we first showed yeah. up at that first meeting. So I'll let you guys speak a little bit more to that. Uh, well, Thomas, you haven't had a chance. Did you want to um, shout out? Sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I have, I've been a lifelong Democrat. Um, this last election was the first election that I, I didn't vote for the Democratic candidate. Uh, and it, it was just very discouraging having a choice between Trump and Hillary, two people who I find equally uh, obnoxious, equally uh, not untrustworthy. Uh, so me getting involved locally was like, okay, what, what can I do to, to change the system, to make sure that the candidates who, who run for all offices represent me and, and represent, I think, the majority of Americans, you know, not just the money to lead. And uh, 
So when we joined with, uh, or tried to join RCDC, Richmond County uh, Democratic Party, it was very shocking to uh, meet, all, and just uh, lack of a better term, old people who hated <laughs> us and yelled at us and told us to get jobs and told a veteran yes, to, get a job. to get a job. Uh, you know, this whole uh, theory that we all live in our mom's basement, uh, that's not true, we don't. <laughs> And uh, it, it's just been very frustrating. And, and here it is six months later, and we still don't have answers. We still don't have a, a membership list. Uh, supposedly, we've all been voted in. Uh, we've, we've been to the meetings, and we've all stood up, and there's like, okay, you're a member. But you can't, we can't get any sort of documentation saying we're actual members, and yet we're voting on initiatives where they're trying to change the bylaws. It's, it's just a mess. and It's, it's quite it's, undemocratic. It's, it's very undemocratic, and it's just an example of... of good old boy system, nepotism of Richmond County, uh, you know, in the 21st century where you have a small group of people who've been running the show for 20, 15, 20 years, yeah. and they don't want to give up the power, they don't want to give up the authority, they don't want to give up the money. Because obviously somebody's getting something out of it if you are going to fight so hard to keep out new members. Mm. Um, and it, it's just been a, it's been a circus. Well, would you guys call this an isolated effort or, you know, you're talking about a Several folks now have mentioned the elections last year. Well, if, if we can't, because I'm excited. Actually, after uh, oh. after Thomas is uh, sort of sort of laying it out there, like what's been happening here and how, uh, I guess to, to bridge with your question, definitely knowing that you know we, we're seeing this all over the country, um, but we're also seeing, uh, I think what it's doing is it's spurring an independent spirit among uh, voters and participants in the process, and also candidates and. That's why I'm really excited. You've already sort of alluded to it during the broadcast here. Uh, I'm excited to get a young guy on the program right now. Uh, we uh, we have an announcement to make, and uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure we'll get we'll get him on the program. But I, I kind of want <clears throat> it to, to to build off what Thomas was saying again, and just that uh, people are coming to the table now that maybe don't represent the same old same old. They don't represent the very groomed types of candidates that we're used to. Um, you know, they they're maybe they're maybe coming from a blue collar background, or they're coming from a more independent streak or more progressive streak, a streak where uh, you know it's uh, it's taking from platform points that were popularized over in 2016 by Bernie Sanders, uh, of all people, an independent, like Long independent Bernie Sanders, Uncle Bernie. So it seems like and. and don't let me speak for you, yeah, but uh, yeah. I think the, the key word, I think, for Bernie's movement, mm -hmm. um, our revolution, and what we're talking about is authenticity for Authentic candidates. Yeah. Authenticity, authenticity and transparency. Right. We want, we want somebody that can look us in the eye and, you know, tell us what they think and also, you know, not provide us some empty promise they're going to represent us. Uh, but actually consider us, actually be more accessible. So and say the um, same thing in each room. Yeah. You know? I, I would rather have someone give me their honest opinion, even if it's not necessarily what I believe, and but not just listen to the polls. Oh, well, what what should I say? What what should I tell the people in this situation? Who am I speaking to? Yeah. Which, is a criticism, which is a criticism that can be applied to the Democratic Party for a lot longer than just the 2016 election. Um, I think last time I was on here, Austin brought up the point that um, Obama even campaigned against uh, supporting same-sex marriage back in 2008. Right. Um, and then once, conveniently, once the polls started indicating that the tide had turned and public opinion had gotten a lot stronger on that issue, suddenly his, his opinion evolved. Well, and now what's the biggest thing? Medicare, you know, uh, Medicare for all or health care, single payer. You know, it used to be you couldn't talk about single payer. Now uh, there's tons of Democrats, you know, right. starting to jump on. And, well, the uh, like Republican senators just called for a vote on it. I mean, even the Republicans. Well, they and they're they're it. trying to yeah they're trying to call some kind of bluff or you know what's funny is we're, we got them shaking and we're not even the majority party now, but we're talking about the very popular. Yeah, I want to hear from a Republican call in <laughs> to talk about the fact that you the Republicans control both houses of Congress and the executive, <laughs> and you still can't pass any legislation. Um, and and I may be alone. Yeah, I may be alone on this, but um. I think it would have been fantastic if the Democrats in the Senate had voted for that amendment. Sure. Saying, you know what, it's probably not going to pass, it's be a good symbolic <laughs> vote, and then accidentally wind up passing Medicare for I all. Know, right. I with some, with awesome. some Republicans that are trying to pull something yeah. back. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and John, well, so can, 
we it's in the house. Is it, I know we got to take a break. So we're gonna be taking we're gonna be going to commercial in about forty five seconds. Okay. Um, as soon as we get back, we can go ahead and open it up and uh, get you. Uh, so get everybody to listen in right now. We'll get back from the break. We're gonna have somebody on who can embody a lot of the things we've been talking about already. And if yeah, if you think about what this conversation has been about, uh, we're talking about authentic candidates, grassroots folks who are not from the political theater getting involved because they are tired of waiting for other for other people to do it and um, that's definitely the uh, uh, the guest that we have coming on is going to be speaking directly to that and so as soon as we get back from the next commercial break uh, we will get him to come on the air and um, ask him some questions uh, I think we're gonna kind of let Joey field the the interview for him and then um, yeah. we'll open it back up to talking about the local Change Richmond County Democratic Party so again Jared Gay Joey Trana Thomas Moss Monica Canty Progressives taking over WGAC. Don't touch that dial. <laughs> FM News Talk WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. I'm Jared Gay filling in for Austin while he's on vacation. If you want to call in later in the program, you can call in at 706-863-5800. Toll free from Aiken at 441-TALK. That's 8255. And Verizon Wireless customers can dial star 580. So uh, we are continuing now uh, with the progressive takeover of WGAC. We were just talking about progressives for democratic reform. Uh, we've got Monica Canty, Thomas Moss, and Joey Train out on here. We've been talking about uh, the, the progressive movement that has popped up within the Democratic Party nationally and locally. And uh, I'm going to pass it off to Joey because we have something very exciting that we are about to uh, air. So, Joey? Yeah, away. man. Well, I mean, you know, on, on the... Uh on, on the wave of this rights previous is out uh, as White House Chief of Staff, Trump's America is every day driving this uh, this uh, this truck off the cliff or this this ship in the uh, in the wrong direction. Um, we're we're I think we're looking at a wave of really independent, really genuine, really authentic candidates um, to come out, and uh, and one of them is someone I just I'm really excited to introduce to everyone who's listening today. Uh, Trent Neesmith is a business owner, a young guy out in Statesboro, um, who I got to know through social media, and and we are definitely on the same wavelength, and I think we've got him on the line. All right, let's go ahead and bring him on. Trent, can you hear us, man? Are you on, dude? Uh, yes, I'm here, guys. Hey, Trent. Awesome. Yeah, hey. So, uh, Monica and Jared and I have met Trent, and uh, I don't think Thomas has had the, has the, has had the joy yet. But uh, but yeah, Trent is just he's 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 down to earth. He's with us. Um, he's been following what we've been doing. And I've been following him down in Statesboro and, and sort of his take uh, on things, on politics, on the Democratic Party, on Trump, um, on what we need to do in Georgia here to sort of bring the Democratic Party back into power. Um, but yeah, Trent, you, we got a we got a break in a little bit. But you got enough time to sort of tell us about yourself, man. Where are you from? Uh, what do you do? What makes you want to run for the District Twelfth? Well, uh, that build-up, not <laughs> grooved and authentic, are uh, <laughs> definitely two two very good descriptive terms for me. So, um, yeah, uh, Trent e. Smith, I'm a proud Bullitt Countyan. I uh, I live in the south end of, of Bullitt County, and that's Brooklyn. Um, I attended the, in the north end of the county, Portal High School, graduate. Um, I went to Georgia Southern in the central part of the county, um, and now Legal. currently on American Roofing there on Main Street in the state. So it's pretty much covered the whole county of Bullock, Bullock um, as far as my roots go. Where are you calling uh, from, Trent? Uh, I'm currently standing on my front porch out in the woods uh, <laughs> in Brooklyn, Georgia. <laughs> um, right. um, I've got lost in those woods trying to find you one time, Trent. That was a good time. <laughs> yeah, I've got, a, I've, got a great, I've got a great story about Joe's first trip out here, uh, but we, we'll save that for a later date. Absolutely. Um, I'm married to a beautiful woman, Samantha Neesmith. She's standing right here beside me. Uh, I've got two beautiful children, um, Sloan 8 and Kate 6, um, and that, that's me. Um, I'm a roofer. Um, I am obsessed with politics, and I think we we uh, we need to be moving in a different direction. All 
All right. So if you, if you missed, if anybody missed the headline of that, if you're just tuning in, uh, we're talking to Trent Neesmith, who has just announced his candidacy for the Democratic nomination for District 12. Uh, he'd be going up against Rick Allen. Uh, we're about to go to commercial break. Trent, can we uh, get you to stick around and talk to us uh, after the break? Absolutely, guys. I'll be here. Sounds good. All right. Progressive Takeover at WGAC. Jared Gay, Joey Trana, Thomas Moss, Mon- uh, Monica Canty talking to Trent Neesmith. See you in a moment. I am 580, 95.1 FM News Talk, WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. I'm Jared Gay, filling in for Vacationing Austin. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800, toll-free from Aiken, by dialing 441-TALK-TALK, that's 8255. And for uh, Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. Uh, We've also got Monica Martinez, Canty, Thomas Moss, and Joey Trana here in the studio with us as a part of the progressive takeover of WGAC for today. And uh, on the phone, we are speaking with Trent Neesmith, who has just announced his candidacy for the District 12 election that would be running against Rick Allen. Uh, Trent, are you still there? Uh-oh. Oh, hold on, let me see. Oh, Trent, oh, you there? Yep, yep, here I am, yep. Awesome. All right, so uh, Joey, I'm going to pass it back over to you. I know you had a few questions that you wanted to uh, put to Mr. Neesmith. Yeah, Trent. Um, well, listen, I mean, I, I really just want to take this opportunity to introduce everyone to Trent. I've uh, personally fall in love with him over the last couple of weeks and uh and uh you know full full disclosure I'm I'm on the team I'm I'm hashtag team Trent all the way. Uh and uh, honestly it's because I think you have well not only do I agree with you, I mean on a lot of items, but I think you have a lot of appeal and happen to really represent the district well, honestly, Trent. I mean um you know I could say more about what I think, but I having you on here, what do you think you know, you've just announced the, the, the district at least is going to get to know you, if not the world, through, you know, the, the web and <laughs> Twitter and all that. But uh, what do you think your strengths are? You know, you, you, we had this conversation, but you, you've, uh, you've been looking at this and you've got some strengths going in here representing District 12. What do you, what do you map those up to be? Hmm. Well, um, I have to say my passion uh, I, I'm, I'm very passionate about our country, um, very passionate about my children's future, um, and I just don't feel very good about the direction we're headed. Um, that, that's probably my ultimate motivator and my ultimate strength uh, is, is, is the passion to, to, to help. Um, I think from owning uh, American Roofing and, 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 and being a, a part of a team, um, a leader on the team. Um, so my leadership abilities, I think, um, would come into play as far as, as you know, being a politician. Uh, and then I just, I hustle. Uh, I think the lack of hustle sometimes out of these politicians as far as getting things done, actually achieving things, uh, you know, meeting in the middle sometimes is, is just part of politics. Uh, I, I also listen. I, I listen very well. Uh, I think that is lacking in our politics today is, is, is politicians that actually listen to their constituents. Uh, I, I, I actually want to talk less and listen more. I think that would be big for politicians to start doing. So I, I think listening is one of my strengths, uh, leadership and passion. Uh, all are, are something that, that if you ask anybody that, that has worked beside me, uh, worked along with me, or, or had any feelings with me, they'll tell you. Uh, I think that I, I strive to, to hustle. So, yeah. That's, that's kind of it. Sure, yeah. No, and I think, um, well, you're hitting on a lot of the reasons, I think, why why we are sitting here at this table and got more involved and want to see some reforms happen, uh, not only with the Democratic Party, but with, but with political leadership uh, across the nation. Um, and you have an interesting story to tell. I think, you know, you, you came from more of a, you know, I would say Jared and I both came from really progressive backgrounds, but you actually come from a more conservative background. Is that right? Your family yeah, and I, uh, community? And, uh, yeah, oh, I have sh- been surrounded my entire life by, by conservatives. Uh, so I, I've, I've really got a good grasp on the, the conservative outlook uh, for the country. Uh, I think I think oftentimes these folks are, are maybe miscategorizing themselves or, 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 or confusing uh, 
you know, what their actual interests are and in when it comes to politics. Uh, so and then I voting that, against their interests, huh? <laughs> and, and then voting directly against their own interests. Hmm. Um, that that seems to be that seems to be uh, a common occurrence with, with the folks that, that I know personally. Uh, and I and I love these people, and, and they they they're dear to me, but but I just disagree uh, yeah. with most of them. So, so would you say in the I, last I, couple of years you've been you've been sort of a black sheep and you know <laughs> opening people's eyes a little bit? You've had had any interesting <laughs> conversations like that? Yes, I, you you can definitely say I am the black sheep uh, <laughs> of, of of the the family and friends that I'm surrounded by. We uh, we definitely do not discuss politics because of of the uh, the, the roads we go down uh, <laughs> once it, once that starts. So I, I just uh, have you had any victories though? Any, any had anybody yeah. see the light or think, hmm, okay, and, you got a point there, Trent? Yeah, and, and I think once once they start listening and we 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 do a little research and and we start using factual evidence. Mm-hmm. Uh, they start to realize, you know, and I think running for Congress will give me, will give me a bit of weight, uh, will, will give me a voice that, that they almost are going to have to listen to. Uh, and, and I think if they'll just listen to me and we'll use factual information and, and, and we'll do this, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm a progressive Democrat, you know, everybody sticks their fingers in their ears. <laughs> I, I, I don't, I, I think... This will give some, some some weight to what I have to say. So, uh, you know, it, it, to me, it's just about facts and data and 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 and, and listening and, yeah. and conversating about what, what needs to happen in the country. So, well, you've been and I've been witness to it. I mean, we've uh, you said folks don't want to talk politics, but you know, after a couple of drinks, we all you know we all loosen up a little bit. <laughs> and I I've, I've seen you uh, you know bring out throw out the facts and figures about uh, how many folks are. Uh, you know, going under due to medic- medical costs or, or student debt, and uh, and I've got an eye on your your platform. And uh, if people want to take a look at it, it's votetrent.com. Uh, we launched it here this this afternoon as as we announced, and um, and there you can see different bullet items about you know Medicare for all and and uh, rescheduling marijuana from dis- from a, a Schedule One narcotic so that uh, you know we can actually do research and 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 we can actually employ therapeutic methods there. Uh, in Georgia, we've had this battle. Of course, for medical marijuana, for a couple sessions now, and uh, and on a farm beyond that, of course, you've got the war on drugs, which has been, you know, something that uh, has ravaged communities uh, across the state, across the southeast, across the country. But uh, you know, we I I, I only have so much time with you. I want to make sure we talk a little bit about sort of what you've been seeing with uh, Rick Allen and and Donald Trump. Uh, because I know those were those were two folks that motivated you. Uh, you being a young business owner, a young contractor, you being someone who's run businesses and run teams, and uh, you, in fact, uh, you have a, a good story to tell about surviving the recession. Uh, tell me about it. Uh, how did you? Because I still don't know. I, I don't know all everything yet. But um, you managed to hold on to all of your team. Is that right? And and rebuild yes. the company, restructure it. Um, but yeah, if you could tie that into kind of how yeah. that brings us to today, you looking at these two leaders and 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 wanting yeah. to get involved. Yeah, it, 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 I often get um, compared to to both of these gentlemen as, as oh, right. business owners, <laughs> um, and, and that that it, that angers me a bit because <laughs> these guys don't. I, I don't know if either one of them could drive a nail. They both claim to be contractors and, and, and be able to build things. I, I am an actual contractor. I started at the at the bottom, and and I, I can and I can you drive know. a nail. I can climb. I can climb on a roof, um, and I and I also can run a business. Uh, and, and I wasn't given anything. Uh, but yes, in 2008, um, everybody knows that, uh, that the economy for for contracting and builders and, and home builders. Uh, took a real hit, and, and we took a real hit. It put a real strain on us and uh, as a company. And, and actually, my brother and I bought the business from my dad in 2008 after putting in eight or nine long years of, of, of actual laboring. Uh, and we rebranded, and we we we, we restructured the company, and, and decided to, to take the country. I mean, take take the company across the country, where, wherever the work was, yeah. uh, all the way from Ohio to Arizona. Um, 
really, really trying to just grab up the the, the opportunities that were out there. Um, but to, but for me to be compared to Rick and, and, and even to Trump is just is just not even a comparison. So I really don't like it. But, but Rick really frustrates me uh, with his lack of of reprimanding our our current president. And, and granted, you, we don't even have to go into policy. Uh, the man should be reprimanded daily, in, in my opinion. Um, on behavior, but, right? Is that what you mean? You mean? Yeah, on his, uh, just strictly <laughs> on his behavior, not necessarily policy. I don't want to argue with the Rush Limbaugh followers. I don't want to <laughs> talk about policy stuff, but just on his behavior, I would not let my son act the way that he does. So, uh, you know, I, I think Rick Allen could have done more for us as the 12th district stood up and said, hey, you know, this, this is this is just absurd. Um, but none of that from him. Matter of fact, on the, just the contrary to that, he turns around and rubber stamps uh, everything that has came out since January. So uh, I just I just don't yeah. think that's fair to the 12. So. Well, and we had I know uh, Monica's got a question for you. If you got time, we we got just a yeah. just another minute or so before we kind of cut you loose and let you uh, hopefully let everybody start following you on social media and everything. But yeah, Monica, what yeah. what come to mind? Well, Trent, I just really want to ask you um, if you do get this seat, will you um, host public town halls where you answer your constituents' questions and concerns? Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Monica. Thank you, Monica. Yeah, that is also another. Uh, concern I have with Rick Allen is his availability. I am a business owner on Main Street in Statesboro, and I have yet to see the man uh, oh. in my city. We um, were at his office. Yeah, we went to his office for <laughs> for a uh, political uh, on healthcare. For, yeah, it was a, a healthcare um, demonstration that we that we were doing through our revolution, and uh, yeah, no, he he didn't make an appearance at his own office either. <laughs> but it no, sounds like you'd no, be no, doing that differently, huh? And, and 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 I and thanks to social media and, and live Facebook and, and these live things that we can do um, in, in this modern age that we we're in. Um, yes, I will be available weekly. Mm -hmm. I, I don't. I don't. I would not feel like I am earning what the country has decided to pay me if I do not make myself available to my constituents. I just. I. It really, really angers me that. Is, he, he, it is really hard yeah. to get a hold of Rick Allen. If, if <laughs> you listeners out there haven't tried, it, it, is, it is really, really tough. Not impossible. Um, yeah. that, that will not be the case with Trent Neesmith. Um, I will be available. I, more importantly, it, this is not about me. This has, it, it, honestly, I am just a, I'm just a carrier of, of a message from the 12th district to Washington. All uh, right. I yeah. need my people to tell me what to do. All right. Uh, well, and, thank you. That's what we're going to have to leave it. Unfortunately, we're about to go into our uh, next commercial break. But Trent, thank right. you so much for calling. And uh, as soon as we get back from the break, we'll also um, plug uh, how folks can find out more about you. Thank and you, again, Trent. Thank you, Trent. Running for District 12. Yep, you got our vote. We'll see you at those listening tours all over go the ahead. district. Take Progressive care. Takeover, right. WGAC. This is AM 580, 95.1 FM, News Talk WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. I'm Jared Gay filling in for Austin, who's on vacation. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800. Toll free from Aiken by dialing 441-TALK. That's 441-8255. And for Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. Uh, we still have Joey Trana, Thomas Moss, and Mar uh, Monica Canty in the studio with us. And we just got off the phone with Trent Neesmith, who announced that he is a candidate for the District 12 seat. So he'll be running against Rick Allen. Uh, he just announced it on the show. Uh, I'm going to pass it back to Joey because um, Joey's been working with Trent's campaign. And I know he uh, wants to give us some more information about how you can find out more about Trent and more about what he stands for. Well, yeah. And, you know, we got a taste uh, of, for, of him and his perspective, uh, his voice and his of course, he's a first-time candidate, um, but he's passionate. He wants to get out there, and he's got a really interesting platform. Um, <clears throat> and you can see more about that at votetrent.com. Uh, also, you can find vote. Uh, sorry, you can find Trent Neesmith for Congress on Facebook. Uh, vote Trent 18 on Twitter. Um, yeah, Trent said he wants to. He wants to have posts that rival, uh, not rival. I guess uh, you, you know, make make Trump irrelevant uh, throughout this race. Uh, and if he can, and if he can answer. Um, 
to uh, to constituency on Twitter. He wants to make it more of a conversation instead of just uh, you know the free association we get from the president uh, throughout the campaign. Uh, go ahead and follow Vote Trent on Twitter and uh, and start a conversation if you want to know more about him and why he's running and what and else. Just for for disclosure, um, are are you speaking as as a surrogate for his campaign? Well, I'm a surrogate. I'm not only a surrogate. I'm I'm on the team, man. We're uh, okay. we're putting together a team right now. Um, and, uh, and so if anybody's looking to volunteer, uh, if anybody's looking to, uh, take up one of the, you know, higher positions that we'll be, we'll be putting together out there, uh, this is, you know, we're serious about running a precinct level campaign. Um, <clears throat> we're serious about making real relationships that aren't necessarily, uh, tied to a partisan label, but are really tied to issues like, uh, you know, Medicare for all and. Yeah. All right. Well, we're about to go to a commercial break. When we come back, uh, we are going to have a pre-recorded interview that uh, is going to be on the air. But as soon as that is finished, we'll be back to talk about the local District 12 race and the Richmond County Democratic Party. Progressive takeover of WGAC continues after this break and interview. Takeover of WGAC. This is Jared Gay, AM 580, 95.1 FM, News Talk WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. I'm Jared Gay, filling in for the vacationing Austin Roads. You can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800, toll free from Aiken by dialing 441-TALK. That's 441-8255. And for Verizon uh, wireless customers, just dial star 580 and we will get you in on the air. We haven't taken too many calls today because we've had a, a lot of a lot of announcements and interviews with folks who are uh, running for local office. But uh, during this last segment, uh, the, especially the, the one coming up after this next break, uh, we do want to take some calls uh, from folks who are interested in... How about that trend Eastman? Yeah, yeah. So for those of you who um, are tuning in just now or who missed the uh, the call before, we just got off the phone before that interview with uh, Trent Neesmith, who is a candidate who just announced that he is running for District 12, um, who hopefully will be running against Rick Allen for that seat. What a quite a constitution on that guy to uh, announce on WGAC on a Friday uh, evening, right? Afternoon? Yeah, that's pretty. Uh, yeah. Who knows how many, you know, conservatives are out there, regular listeners, or maybe some progressives that decided to listen. But I uh, encourage you to, to go to his page and, yeah. and take a look at his message and just hear him out. Yeah, absolutely. And, and for, you know, conservatives who are listening who are maybe right now thinking, I, there's no way that I can see myself voting for anybody who self-identifies as a Democrat. Um, or especially anybody who says that he is on the left wing of that party. Um, one of the issues that we didn't get a chance to ask um, ask Trent about on the air is an issue that I know many of the people listening now um, probably do care a lot about, which is guns. One of Austin's favorites. One of all, yeah. I mean, one of my favorite issues uh, too. I mean, that's one of the issues where where I tend to disagree with the mainstream Democratic Party. Uh, tends to be areas where they are more conservative than I am, but one area where that's not the case is probably gun control. Um, you know, I'm a gun owner. I'm a concealed carry permit holder. Um, I believe in you know responsible uh, gun ownership, of course, but um, I definitely am not somebody who would ever get behind any kind of a gun ban. And uh, from my own conversations with Trent, it seems like he's not that kind of person either. He uh, he, you know, I'll let him speak for himself. But um, Joey, I know that you've spoken with him a lot about this issue too. Um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. Very, very common sense stuff, um, but it's it's also, you know, coming at it from the angle that uh, because uh, Trent is himself, uh, you know, concealed carry uh, 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 permit owner and then someone who uh, basically has, has told me, you know, and I, and I can empathize with this as someone who actually uh, does not own any firearms is that you don't want you know when you're a parent which i am and and when you're you know when you're out and maybe you're working uh jobs that are out in places you're not familiar with you don't want anybody to have a one-up over you Uh, especially if your your family's around if your kids are around and i and i can empathize with that um and and but also just looking at it from the standpoint as, as well that he also agrees that somebody like his mom who wants to maybe go get a pink uh, <laughs> uh, 
a pink uh, lock or something. It needs training, right? It needs to have a level. So I know we just got back, uh, but in about 15 seconds, we're going to be going into the half-hour break. Uh, we'll have two um, open segments when we get back. Uh, one of the things that we haven't talked a lot about that we definitely are going to when we come back is the Richmond County Democratic Party and the elections that are coming up and allegations of malfeasance that may wind up being adjudicated in court. So there's definitely plenty to uh, tune in to here, especially if you care about those issues. So uh, when we come back, we'll talk about that, and then uh, we'll give you guys an opportunity to field a few calls, and then that'll do it for the Progressive Takeover. We'll be back. Problems for you. All right, AM 580, 95.1 FM, News Talk WGAC. This is the Austin Road Show. I am Jared Gay, filling in for Austin while he is on vacation. Uh, you can reach us by dialing 706-863-5800, toll-free from Aiken by dialing 441-TALK. That's 441-8255. And for Verizon Wireless customers, dial star 580. We do have a few people on the lines, and we are going to get to as many of them as we can during this break. Right before we do, or during this segment, right before we do that, though, we want to kind of contextualize one of the things that we wanted to come on and talk about. So one of the reasons that we're calling this the progressive takeover of WGAC is because we are all, um, I say we, I mean Jared Gay, myself, Joey Trana, uh, Thomas Moss, and Monica martinez Canty are all members of a group that we started together called Progressives for Democratic Reform. The group existed. For those of you who have heard uh, me come on the show uh, before and talk about this issue with Austin, this is a, a group that started to get involved with the Democratic Party here in Richmond County. Unfortunately, whenever we showed up, being a group of younger people, being a group of people who skew further to the left than most um, older or more mainstream Democrats. And Bernie supporters. And Bernie supporters. Uh, the very first time that we came to one of the meetings, we were shouted at, uh, kicked out, and, and threatened to have the, the police call on us by Lowell Greenbaum. After all that happened, they um, denied our membership applications at least long enough to prevent us from voting in December uh, where when they had the executive committee elections. We were trying to join so that we could have a voice in those elections. Unfortunately, they kept us from doing so. So going back to December, the current executive committee is completely illegitimate. They were not voted in following the bylaws of the party, and then, of course, since then, they have uh, deliberately tried to prevent us from becoming official members of the party. They did that for several months. They um, wouldn't tell us once we were made members. We asked uh, for what members are, are allowed to have, uh, which is a, a copy of the membership list so that we can know which districts have um, are, are more or less full, which districts have vacancies, how many people who are members of the committee are people who have not attended uh, meetings in a long time and therefore are liable to be taken out of the committee so that newer people can come in. Um, they knew that we wanted to do that, and so they, they did everything they could to prevent, uh, give, uh, prevent us from getting this list. We uh, eventually reached out to the state, to the Democratic Party of Georgia. The state uh, did contact them and told them that they were required to give us a copy of this list still several months later. Even now, I think the first time we asked for this list was back in January. Uh, we're now reaching the end of July, and we still have not been given a copy of this list, and despite the fact that the Democratic Party of Georgia has, has instructed the, uh, the committee here in Richmond County to do this many times over. So still don't have a copy of that list. Last, uh, where that currently stands is the Democratic Party of Georgia has received the membership list from Richmond County Democratic Party and has said that they are validating the list for themselves. Problem with that, though, because they also uh, declined to allow us to videotape several of the meetings where these uh, members were put on the membership list, there is no way to reproduce um, any paper trail that shows when a person was made a member of the Democratic uh, Committee here in Richmond County. So therefore, there's, there's no way that any list they could produce at this point could be looked at as legitimate because we don't have any kind of timeline for when these people were added on there. Um, so what we're alleging is not no list. There, there is no list. Sense. Yeah, there is no list that makes There's sense. There's no membership. We have to start new. We and have to start fresh. And that's what we've been asking for for months with the Richmond County Democratic Party and with the Democratic Party of Georgia. At this point, everybody on the executive committee knows that we are demanding across the board elections. Um, meaning that they need to have new general committee elections, not just to fill vacancies on the committee, but across the board so that we can make sure that from this point forward, everybody who's on that membership list is a, a member in good standing given the bylaws of the Democratic Party of Georgia and the Richmond County Democratic Party. Only way to do that is to have entirely new elections for all general committee positions and all executive committee positions. The 
executive committee was elected in an improper process that shut out a number of legitimate people who were trying to have a voice in that election completely out. And that has not been remedied. So right now there is nothing about membership for Richmond County Democratic Party, general committee or executive committee that can be looked at as legitimate. We're demanding from the state and from the Richmond County Democratic Party entirely new elections. We've been back and forth with them on this several times. Joey and I have both been on the phone. Several of our members have been on the phone and email with the Democratic Party of Georgia, speaking with Melba Steps, the county coordinator for the Democratic Party of Georgia, who has told us that the Democratic Party of Georgia is aware that – pay attention to this. The Democratic Party of Georgia has told us that they are aware of the fact that for the last 16 years, for at least the entire time that Lowell Greenbaum was chairman of that party, that they were not operating according to the bylaws of the Democratic Party of Georgia or, in many cases, the actual Richmond County Democratic Party. And not only have they told us that, and we can tell you on the radio, we can prove it because we have it recorded. <laughs> conversation uh, where that happened it's you know uh and, and what has the state party of, of georgia done about it if right now about it for they years? sent they sent no, it, oh no they, during the last 16 years nothing um in regards to our complaints they contacted, they, they hoped that we that it would fix itself or that, that we somehow would stop rather we could just fix it ourselves exactly and this is us <laughs> trying to fix it ourselves but we can't do it by ourselves as long as uh the folks who have stacked the, stacked the deck uh continue to deal out all the cards um, and that's where we are now because uh, – and why, why should this matter to anybody who's listening? Maybe you're not involved with the Democratic Party. Maybe you have considered it in the past. Uh, this has to do with uh, a democratic vote. Uh, we live in a democratic republic. Our votes need to count. They need to matter. And in a county that has a Republican committee and a Democratic committee and independent voters, uh, we have to have fidelity in the process. We have to have efficacy in the process. Um, and here's your opportunity, in other words, and this is what we want to make sure everybody understands, is in September, on the 13th, that second Wednesday, uh, there will be district caucus elections. Whether they're held democratically or not is really up to whether you show up. You uh, do not have to be <laughs> a member of the committee currently to vote in this election. Do you live in Richmond County? If you're saying yes, next question, do you identify as a Democrat? If the answer to that question is yes, you are eligible to vote in September. Right now, the only vote that is happening in September that they have announced is the, the state party forced uh, Richmond County Democratic Party to have a, an election in September to fill post vacancies. So this list that nobody has seen a copy of, this, this completely fraudulent list that is going to wind up being thrown out in court, um, they are holding an election to fill in any – vacancies that are in that list. So say right. that you so, live in district, you know, three and say that district three currently only has uh, three members out of the um, 15. What be, 15 who are, uh, who can be members of that district. All you got to do is show up. They'll separate you into different groups, different caucuses, depending on which district you live in. And then the people in that group amongst themselves will vote to approve the people in that caucus. If there's 15 or fewer, everybody presumably will get in. If there are more than 15, then that's when it gets interesting, and your district caucus will kind of decide who's going to fill the first uh, 15 spots and then who will be at-large members. Um, so we need as many people as possible to come yeah. out. So turn out. Right. So September there are eight 13th. districts in Richmond County. If you do not know what district you live in, do not feel bad. Do not let that keep you <laughs> away from coming. Um, go to Progressives for Democratic Reform. We're on Facebook. Comment. Message us. We will help you. We understand the county has not been doing its job to show you how to get involved in the democratic process. So please like us on Facebook. Comment. Message us with any questions or concerns that you have. Again, you do not have to be... Uh, wanting to serve on the committee, you can just come vote people in, you know, hear us out why we should be on the committee serving you. So eight districts, um, there are 15 seats in each district. And um, as Jared said, we are just filling vacancies as of right now, but I encourage you to come out. Um, we also host weekly meetings um, for Progressives for Democratic Reform. Our next one will be Wednesday at um, seven o'clock at Rancho downtown. Um, come meet us, uh, ask us questions. We want you to get involved. We want to hear your concerns, and please don't shy away if you're new to politics or don't know what's going on. Um, we're here to help you and really make this county what it should be. Absolutely, because, I mean, honestly, here's where we stand with it. This, this vacancy-filling election that's happening in September is not addressing the overarching issue of the fact that the membership list is invalid and the executive committee is invalid because both 
violated um, the both of them violated the, uh, the the bylaws of the Democratic Party of Georgia and the Richmond County Democratic Party whenever they um, whenever they held the, the fraudulent elections back in December and then um, not giving us a, ver- a way to verify the membership list. Uh, they tried to prevent us from being able to video record or audio record um, the county meetings, even though they're public meetings. Eventually, the, the DPG did instruct them that they had to allow us to record. Um, and so the last couple of meetings we have recorded, but unfortunately there are like three meetings that we were prevented from video recording, and those just happen to be the three meetings where the majority of people who are now on the committee were voted in or recertified using a process that does not exist in the bylaws. Well, All the, of this the first is, one was recorded. The recertification, <laughs> the actually, oh, the recertification, the recertification, was. recertification yeah, process December. was recorded. So we actually have it on video where they tried, they just kind of slick tried to, to carry on a process that is, just doesn't exist. So this is where the state party can really lead here. We, we, we want them to. We would back up anyone mm-hmm. who wants to conduct business above board. Um, and that's the thing. We're not out here to, to drag anybody's name through the mud. It's just it's your behavior. And just like the progressives are on here and we're promoting a candidate, we're promoting a platform, we can't do that with efficacy. We can't have other people buy in if we don't have a, a system ourselves that's not, uh, that's, that doesn't follow its own rules. And let me just real quick say, why does this matter again to folks in Richmond County, even if you've never been involved in politics or even if you've been on the margins or you consider yourself a fence sitter or maybe you don't, you don't prefer either side? It matters to Richmond County because uh, <laughs> Richmond County is, is one of the largest consolidated county cities in the state of Georgia. Um, we have an economy. We have a, a, a fort. We have a, a we have a, a District 12, which we're a part of. We're the, we're the largest uh, county of. Uh, we are, you know, we, we have uh, we skew the demographics in this area toward young people, and so that's why this was kind of interesting here at the table. We didn't we didn't all set out to be an under thirty, under forty crowd, but it just so happens that the folks that are sitting at this table, and uh, the majority of folks that come to our progressives for democratic reforms meetings, you know, we happen to be we have to skew younger, and so does Richmond County, so does District Twelve. Uh, the largest nine-year demographic uh, is twenty-five to thirty-four, and you wouldn't know it if you look at our leadership. And that's why getting involved at the county level is so important because the more we show up, the more impact we have, the more influence we have, and the more the, the, the closer we get to actually becoming the leaders in this county instead of being dictated to by folks that have been running it for the last 20, 30, 40, 50 years uh, without consideration for us and where we need to head as a county and a city and a district. We, we've only got a few minutes until next break. I do want to try to get in at least one phone call, but the other main reason that this is important, um, let me speak completely plainly. At this point, we have lobbied the executive committee to do the right thing. We've gotten nowhere with it. We've given them every opportunity for the last seven and a half months to take the benefit of the doubt and do right. They have not done so. So we took it to the uh, Democratic Party of Georgia. For now, for the last four and a half months, we've been on the phone on and off with the Democratic Party of Georgia, email, trying to get them to enforce their own bylaws and to, to correct the process before it goes any farther. Unfortunately, they have done very little of that and are now showing no indication that they are. The only next place that this can go is court. Joey and I are planning on filing a, a suit in civil court in Atlanta against the Richmond County Democratic Party and the Democratic Party of Georgia for not following their own bylaws. That is what's going to be happening next week. They could have delivered this week. They this could have message, delivered last month. They could and have we told them this, by the way. This is not this is not new to them. Yeah, these are no secret. I specifically told them um, we all have. Well, they've been tested in so many words, dared it. Yeah, to us. Basically said, okay, well, fine, if that's what you want to do. That's what it takes. So this really is <laughs> literally, job. <laughs> this announcement is literally the last opportunity for this committee to, to do right, um, to avoid having the next however long tied up in court when we should be campaigning for District 12, when we should be campaigning for progressive uh, candidates who we can all get behind. If we want a unified it's party, resisting. it shouldn't have to happen over a multiple month to year process that takes place in court. But that's where we're at, unfortunately. I wish I could say different. As a Democrat, as a progressive, I wish I could say that that was not the case. Um, but – and this is not – Richmond County is not – It's not unique this, to this Richmond County. Yeah. But it's also not the same across the board either. Their, Columbia County runs their meetings entirely properly according to the bylaws. Elizabeth Hahn's doing a fantastic job. But unfortunately, the Democratic committee uh, here in Richmond County – has been criminally negligent of their own bylaws and the bylaws of the DPG. At this point, we have no other recourse besides taking to the public like we're doing now 
and taking it to court, which we've already spoken with. Uh, we've already been speaking with attorneys. We've shown them the evidence that we have. We can reproduce all of this. If you're interested in seeing this, go to our Progressives for Democratic Reform Facebook page or website. We'll plug that when we come back from the break and, um, and check it out for yourself because anybody, including a judge, who looks at the bylaws and then looks at what we have recorded, it's open and shut. They'll look at it and say, okay, clearly they did not follow that when they did this. Therefore, we're passing an injunction. You got to take it back to the committee elections across the board, new elections. If you want DPG, RCDC, if you want to avoid a lawsuit, that is how you do it across the board elections. Anything well, short, we'll see you in court. How about we take process, a call? You know? uh, we're about to take a call. Um, we got to wrap it up for just a sec, though. As soon as we come back, uh, we've got about five more minutes. We are going to take calls. If you're on the line, stick around, and uh, we will close out the hour. Progressive takeover. AM 580, 95.1 News Talk, WJAC, Austin Roadshow. I'm Jared Gay filling in for the next six minutes for the vacationing Austin. Um, we're only going to have time to get to the folks who are on the line. Um, so we're going to take a couple of calls. But before we do, real fast, if you are interested in what we've been talking about, you want to find out more, you want to find out about the upcoming election on September 13th, all of that, uh, find out more information about the lawsuit, any of it. Check us out on Facebook, Progressives for Democratic Reform. We've got a Facebook page and a group member forum. We also have a website that you can find by looking us up on Facebook. Again, Progressives for Democratic Reform. Check us out. Um, if you liked what you heard today, next week, Joey and I are also, and, and several of the other members are also going to be starting a podcast that we're going to be putting on. You can uh, tune into that and hear us. Again, Progressives for Democratic Reform. Thank you guys for listening. We're going to go out on a phone call. So um, we have a couple of people who've been waiting for a few minutes, and I'm going to go ahead and queue up. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing this right. Is, Perrin. It, is it Perrin? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Hey, Perrin. Hey, Perrin. Hey. What can I do for you? I think I talked to you last time you uh, co-hosted with Austin. Excellent. And, uh, we had a little conversation about the left and the right and the, and the far left and the far right. Okay. Um, I didn't know you were going through all those troubles with the uh, Richmond County Democratic Party. Um I live in Columbia County, so I would come out and support you guys, but um, I'm going to guess I'll try, get, try to get involved here in the Columbia County Democratic Party. Please do. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Hahn is great. The Columbia County Democratic Party, we have nothing but nice, nice right, things so to say well. about them. And you're also in District 12, well probably. Care of. And if, uh, yeah, I'm in Rick Allen's district. And you can, uh, come to, um, you can still come to Richmond County Democratic Party meetings. You just wouldn't be able yeah. to join the committee. Yeah. I did hear about your uh, the dude who uh, announced for his candidacy, candidacy I guess. Uh, Trent Neesman? Um, does he have the... Uh, do you have the backing of the Democratic Party, or is he just like a progressive? Well, right now, there, group? yes, uh, the second one. Right now, there are other uh, candidates who may be announcing, yeah. so uh, the, the party hasn't endorsed anybody yet. Yeah, yeah they won't until after the primary in April, so. Yeah, I mean, we're getting 2018 coming around pretty soon, so uh, pretty people are just starting to get, uh, get ready for it. But uh, you did pretty good today. Well, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, I'll just come back next week, so and be all. Yeah. Gonna change, but we'll, we'll try to keep it to him. Yeah, I'll probably come back. Tell him to let us back. Yeah, tell him to make us come back. Yeah, I'll try. Right. He, he's invited to be out there, but uh, I don't know. He, I, he's still on talk. He, wants, he likes to show. He likes his popularity. I we'll come to our progressive yeah, Democratic where, Reform meeting next week. Me Rancho, 7 o'clock next week. I'd like to see we're we're very, down. Yeah, I might come grab a beer. We're, we're actually absolutely. appreciative of Austin Rhodes for allowing us to for sure. be on his yeah. show, especially when the other local media outlets, Augusta Chronicle, Metro Spirit, uh, they have TV. basically refused to cover the issues we're talking about with the local Democratic Party. So uh, thank you. Uh, you're Austin Rhodes. Chronicle, but I think the Spirit would be on your side at least. Um, I'm hoping so, and I'm hoping that now that you know we're, we're starting to get more traction about the, the issues that we're talking about uh, on the show, hopefully we'll get some more interest from uh, other local media. But um, yeah. we're going to have to wrap it up, though. We're uh, heading into the last news break and then the next program. So cool. um, thank you so much for calling in. Well, appreciate it. You are going to have a good, you good job. Have a good weekend. You too. Thank you. All right. So that concludes the progressive takeover of WGAC. I'm sure that uh, I'll be back on at some point to talk to Austin about everything that's going on. Please check us out, Progressives for Democratic Reform. Uh, next Wednesday is our next meeting, Mirancho downtown. Also look up Trent Neesmith, uh, N-E-S-T, uh, how was it? Any yes. Smith. Oh, Any e. Smith. There you go. Trent Nee Smith. And um, also do, uh, Dr. Drew Kemp, who is running for Columbia County Board of Education. Check him out. And uh, again, thank you to Austin for letting us on. That music means that it is time to wrap it up. So everybody have a wonderful weekend. Thank you, and uh, weekend. 2020. Go check us out. Conservative world. <laughs> All right. Progressive Takeover concluded. Philosophy done.